Yes, sir. Took me a while. No, no problem, man. No problem. Okay. I already let you, I already allowed you to demo the screen if needed. Now tell me how I do that. Okay, so share screen. Yeah, share screen. You click on it and then and then you just choose the choose your desktop and that's it. Or you can go and choose your presentation right away. Well, so should I should I open the presentation first on my You can do both. It's up to you. Okay, so there's that. Let's see. Okay, so if I go to share share screen, so mm -hmm. what comes up is whiteboard, iPhone, iPad, um, desktop. Okay, there we go. Yes. Do you Perfect. see it? Yep. Okay, now if I go full screen. Okay. This is looking okay. too nice already, from right from the first slide. <laughs> yeah. That's quite the picture. <laughs> so you said the down arrow is what I, yeah, that picture looks good. Okay, I got this. All right. All right, not hard. We didn't have to get on an hour early for that. <laughs> yeah, when I did the first one, my first presentation, uh, I think already two months ago, I was like, oh, how do I do that? And that was uh, that big conference that uh, that was the first one. And I was a little bit like nervous how to make it happen because I never used Zoom. And the host was like, no worries, it's easy. You'll, you'll get it, it's not that hard. <laughs> and then now doing all that for two months, I'm like, okay, it was really easy. I'm glad, I'm glad Nick is helping though with putting uh, all the schedule, all the links together. Because if I would do that, that would be pre that would be pretty hard. I have a lot to do later. The time zones is tough. There's a lot of different time zones out there. <laughs> yeah, I still remember when you were sending the sending me the posters, and I would see the times like completely messed up. And I'd be just laughing, and I know probably when I message you saying the different times, you would be like, oh, again. Yeah, there's so many. I mean, I was getting so confused. But I found a good website where it tells you all the time zones, and I was good. Mm -hmm. All right, We've got your former player, Rob, here too. Yes, sir. What's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> I knew you'd make it. So, of course. <laughs> I need to make it for the comedy hour. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. My wife just looked at this and she was like, you forgot some jobs on here. So I was like, oh yeah. I had them, Nick, Bossy and my wife proofread it. <laughs> I need a lot of, you know, that kind of help constantly. <laughs> yep. We're all, all ready to help. Well, it's 10 of one. Um, Brian, are you ready? Sure, I'm ready. Okay, so first of all, I want to welcome everyone uh, to another presentation with another great speaker. Uh, it's Brian Walsh. He's uh, assistant coach for South Bay Lakers and his, ex his experience speaks for itself. Uh, he'll talk a little bit more about it and he'll also talk about uh, what you need to do in order to be successful assistant coach. So Brian, now it's all up on you. All right. Thanks for everyone for getting on. I mean, I appreciate it right now. I'm currently down South Southern New Mexico, close to the border. It's, I love it down here. They, a lot of people down here haven't really changed their life much with what's going on. So it's kind of weird, but, um, it's really nice, and again, I want to thank you guys. I want to start by saying I don't want this to really be about me. I you know typically that's the you know that's the way an assistant coach should go about the way they do things. It's not really about them. 
You know, I've basically always felt like I'm a, you know, a worker, I'm a janitor, I do whatever needs to be done. And that's basically what this is about. I mean, I'm going to go through some slides really quickly. Again, I don't want to sit here and drone on. I really like to get to the question and answer part quickly. But at any point, you know, send your questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, um, like we already mentioned, currently I'm with the South Bay Lakers. I've been lucky to be here for five years. Um, and when we go down here pretty soon to see my experience, you'll see that I've moved around a lot. And um, whether, you know, if, if you become a coach, whether you're a professional coach or a high school coach, I think you're lucky to be able to stay in a place for uh, a certain amount of time because you'll see how much I've moved throughout the years. And so um, without any more of that, let's just get going. I'll give you guys my history as we start. These are the jobs that I think, I think they're all of my jobs in the United States. Uh, when I first started coaching out of, um, out of college, I stayed in New Mexico and coached basketball and football, American football in, um, in, um, sorry, immediately my family starts texting me, um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. My first job was um, a varsity uh, football coach uh, I was an assistant coach uh, with a, a big team in Albuquerque. And then I stayed uh, coaching basketball, which is what I knew I was going to do as I come out of, out of college. Um, I was lucky to be able to move up quickly in Albuquerque and then become a, a varsity uh, uh, basketball coach at Cibola High School and Albuquerque High School. Um, and throughout those times, um, I coached when you're coaching in high school, if you want to have a good team, you want to coach all the teams down throughout your program. So I was coaching middle school, little kids, uh, along with the JVC team. You know, those are immense jobs and you're working, you know, long hours for absolutely no money. And, you know, you have to love it. So we'll get back through that. These are the jobs and this might be, this might not be too interesting. So we'll go through them quickly. But I started, my first job outside of high school was in the CBA. Uh, and the CBA and International Basketball League merged that year. And it was the New Mexico team and the International League and then the CBA. I moved on to Baylor University because I was the benefit of having a really good player uh, two years earlier when I was a high school coach. Um, and after that, those two years, that was when 9-11 happened back then. That's how long ago it's been. Um, I went to the Dota Wizards. Yeah, go ahead. Was someone going to say something? No, no. He was. Oh, okay, he I'm was sorry. Unmuted. And then, yeah. and then, and then now you guys see down there in the bottom, those are all the G League teams that I've been with in all the seasons. Um, I was, um, I guess maybe one of the years Dakota was actually in the, the G League, but, you know, again, as I get old and you go and we go down. So those teams, the Colorado 14ers, Albuquerque, Rio Grande Valley Vipers, and the South Bay Lakers for five seasons. Then I went overseas. And as I said, these are some of the teams I worked with overseas and some of the things I did. I also forgot a couple jobs in here. I was in Southeast Asia in Vietnam for a couple years and then a couple other places in Europe and Scandinavia. But again, I don't want to make this about myself. I want to kind of get to the content as we go and go through this. And hopefully people can, you know, and if you want to see this, again, we'll send these to you as we go. But before we start and as we go, and it doesn't matter what level you're coaching at, um, being an assistant coach, a lot of times we have um, ambition to be a head coach. But you have to start and you have to, and you have to, focusing on what you're doing from the standpoint of just doing the work and how you build up. Now in pro basketball right now, typically guys can move up pretty quick. So um, they have knowledge of the game, but then they start coaching at a high level with little experience. That's fine too. If you can do that, I'm down. I, I don't have any, any, um, anything against someone that can move up quickly, but you have to grasp all these things and be able to go. So before we start, I talk about what's your constitution and what's inside of you. Um, my question to you is, and the things that you deal with, there's some, some, some challenges as an assistant coach. 
you have ideas all the time. We're throwing out ideas all the time. The head coach whose job it is, it's his job and it's his name on it. It's not your name on it. But can you throw something out that was ex absolutely right? Have your head coach say no. Have you play a game and you guys lose miserably, but after the game you were right. And this has happened to me a hundred times, and it's also happened to me a hundred times when I was absolutely wrong. But leaving the court or a day later, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, remember when you were suggesting that zone? We probably should have done that. You need to put these things in your mind before they happen because that's what's going to make sure – that's what's going to allow you to be able to commit to a person. When you're an assistant coach, you're committing to a person. The head coach needs you very much, but they also need you to be strong inside. There's no way of coaching. Do you understand what I mean by that? There's no way of coaching. I've been with guys I completely disagree with, and then we just destroy. Um, I've been with guys I completely agree with, and we were terrible. There's no way that works. There's every way works as long as you can get your team together and you can play. Um, do you have the constitution to be told no and just handle it? Um, you know, can you – Shut up and listen to people. That's a big deal. I mean, when we get in coaching, typically young coaches want to get in there and they're all fired up and they want to show what they know. They want to show how good they are and they don't listen that much. You have to listen much more than you talk. And as we keep going down um, and now as we get to it, whether I'm coaching in high school or I'm coaching in the pros, will you wipe up sweat? Will you clean the floor? Are you going to stay late? Are you going to do laundry if you have to? I mean, I've had head coaching jobs where I've had to do laundry before. Is anything below you? Um, whether you deal with that or not now or later, um, you'll find some people jump into a position and get there, and all of a sudden they're not going to do that much. They're just going to coach. I'm here to coach. I'm here to do this. I don't do that. I'm an assistant coach. I'm a basketball coach. I'm not a referee or I'm another coach, you know, does someone else's responsibility bother you? If, if coach brings you guys all in together and says, okay, you, got, you have the blue team, you have the red team, Walsh, you ref. Does that bother me that I don't have one of the teams? So you have to think about these things as you go. And I, again, I want to go through these more uh, quickly than I just went through that one. Um, another thing, who do you work for? You have to know this. Sometimes I've taken jobs where I didn't know the person at all. Um, in fact, Kobe Carl, I didn't know him at all before we took this job. And now I, you know, I'd venture to say it's been successful five years later. Uh, I've worked for him longer than anybody else in my career. And going back to 1990, now it's 30 years of both assistant and head coaching jobs. So that's something to be proud of. But is your coach, and we go through this quick, is he a dictator who runs the system down to the detail? Doesn't give you much say, but just wants you to be there to work. Or is he a liberal guy that brings everybody together and asks for all your opinions? Um, you know, that, I would say now Kobe is the most inclusive coach that I've been around. Um, I've also, you know, I've had coaches somewhere in between. But with Kobe, he'll bring us all in and we'll meet for two hours going over every single drill that we do. And he's just will do whatever we say. I've also had coaches that don't want your opinion at all about practice. They just want you to be ready to do the practice. Um, whether your coach is a best friend, is a family member, someone you never know, knew before, it shouldn't really change the way you approach your job. I mean, you are just, you're just part of the culture and you have to fit in. And then again, as you guys saw, I've worked for people from many different cultures I've learned that like uh, one quick story, I was told in China when I got there because I couldn't really understand the translators, even though they could speak English. I had a guy tell me, in, a, in China, we don't speak like a tennis match like in, like in America. We speak like a bowling match. We, don't, we talk about what we're talking about, not what you're talking about. That's why you're not understanding. You have to change and understand this culture, okay? And also, can you work well for someone you don't like? I mean, you have to be able to, and it shouldn't matter. You don't have to love each other. You just have to be able to get it done. As we continue on, you know, what does your head coach need for you? Obviously, we could go through a billion things on here. 
I'm not in here to spend a lot of time droning on about offenses and defenses. One thing you need is your energy. You can't get the practice. This is what I, I kind of want to put it this way. Head coaches are grinded to the bone. You know, I mean, that's the beauty of being an assistant. You don't have to worry about the general manager or the principal or the team owner. You don't have to worry about them as an assistant. You can show up. Every day the, the coaches are grinded. They need to show up to the practice and see a coaching staff that's ready to go. Not sitting on the side, not typically shooting or on their phone, but they need to be ready. They need to be ready that have gone through their practice schedule, know every drill. There's nothing worse, whether you're an assistant, head coach, than looking and seeing one of your colleagues that's like, hey, yo, middle of practice, what are we doing next? What are we doing next? And I've done that before, but I've learned over my years, you have to be ready beforehand. You can't just get there. And a lot of times it seems like a casual situation, but you show up to the gym. If it's a last minute thing, you get that practice schedule and you go through it. You see your responsibilities and you be ready for them. Another thing is optimism. I mean, a lot of us are coaching uh, and a lot of people are coaching so many mistakes all the time that it's just a constant grind of negativity about, oh, he's not doing this, he's not doing this. I like the way we do it now. We focus a lot on the positive, but optimism is what you need to be as an assistant coach. Your head coach will take care of all that shit. That's what he's about. He, that's his job. If he doesn't like something, he'll jump on it. If he wants you to jump on it, typically he'll tell you, hey, yo, Walsh, uh, if they do this wrong, I need you to stop it and do this. You don't really want it. You want to learn your coach and figure out if he wants you to do those type of things. But then the integrity part comes in, like what are you going to do? And the eroding integrity right now in the world, can you be the person that, it, that upholds it? And by that I mean, can you speak directly to players? Can you tell coaches when you, did, when you don't agree with them? Can you tell them things that are difficult to hear? You have to be able to figure out ways to do that and still show them that you're on their side, okay? Assistant coaches, again, should be able to, in this quote I put on here, and uh, it says assistant coaches should bleed examples of how to approach the day-to-day. -day. That means assistant coaches are examples to everybody about getting there on time. And by on time, I mean an hour before, maybe even more. And we, I think I have something in there where we'll talk about this later. But being prepared, doing the extra work. When you have five seconds to stand, asking the trainer, asking the people around you what they need from you. You aren't the guy that's standing up on the top of the pedestal. You're the one just trying to get things going. You want to get practice going smoothly. You want to get players there on time. A lot of times a, a head coach will say to me, hey, let's don't mess with them. If they're late, we'll take care of them. And, I, and I'll always go with them on that. But also I think of the head coach. If things have been going shitty that week, maybe that week, and I say, shit, we need to have a good practice tomorrow. I'm going to make sure everybody is there on time tomorrow. I'm not, I don't say it to anybody, but I'm like, I'd rather get the head coach on the court in a good mood with everybody there than have to deal with it after. Now, maybe that's me enabling them a little bit, but if I go at it one time, get them all there on time, and then we have a great practice, then I'll feel like, hey, I did something on the back end of it where nobody knew, but I really helped that practice out that day. Those are the true things I think that assistant coaches do, that, and you should just take it inside of yourself that you're doing a good job because you've done it and nobody else knows. Only you know what you did in a situation like that. Um, and I put down there, I don't wanna go talking about commitment. We talk about it too much. Um, commitment's just the grind. And that's just, are you willing to do something that may or may not benefit you, but will benefit everybody else? Um, and we say that word too much. Okay, what does a head coach not need? Typically, get to know him first. If you already know him, great. But you don't have to be the brilliant offensive mind, defensive mind. You don't need that. That's why they're there. A head coach wants to run his system. Um, and if he want, and he's going to ask you a hundred times throughout the year, what should we do here? What's your idea? 
your brilliance will come out. You don't have to throw it out at him. It's going to come out. You have to, it's almost like a player. You want to be patient. You're, the, the cream will rise to the top. As somebody, I think Nick said that in, uh, in his, the cream will rise to the top. You don't have to show how great you are immediately. It'll get there, okay? Um, again, unscheduled talk. Talking too much in practice is something you need to speak to your head coach about beforehand. Some coaches are okay with you stopping practice. Some don't like it. You better know beforehand or you're, you're going you're gonna to find out the hard way, okay? I said this before. Uh, being a head coach is a grind. You don't want to make it worse, okay? Um, head coaches don't want to talk to you about preparation. Honestly, if that's what – if, if you get a preparation talk as an assistant, then you, don't, you want to make sure that doesn't happen again, okay? And um, you also don't want to have the professionalism talk. I myself, in my 100 years of doing this, I still have those talks every year. I still mess up every now and then. I still bullshit to the refs when I shouldn't. I still do some things I shouldn't, but I make sure that I get on it and don't let it happen again. Um, so you're going to mess up, but those things, make sure that things click in your mind. If you get a coach that says the word preparation to you or professionalism, you kind of jack, that's a big mess up. You better get it right the next day and from that point on. You don't want those talks. So this, this one at the bottom, it's just a real quick one. I've had a coach before say he came to practice late. He had, he got a flat tire. And when he got there, he was an inexperienced guy. And I was like, a flat tire would never, ever be a, an excuse to be late. And he looked at me oddly. Like, what do you mean? It's a flat tire. I would never leave my house with, with, I, okay. I'll get to practice typically as early as I can, meaning, two hours before we have meetings before, but I'm at the gym probably just at the, at the start of the work day. A lot of people that work for, you know, high schools or, or kids uh, basketball, you can't get there that early, but you have to get to that gym as early as you can to where anything goes wrong. You can already get your car fixed or get a bus and get there in, in, in more than enough time. So, that's, I don't want to say commitment. I want to think of another word, but understanding to be there so far in advance that you're going to show to your head coach, this guy would never be late no matter what. No matter what I throw at him, he's here three hours before. And that's what my career has been. I'll never let those type of things that I could fix hurt me. Um, okay, this is a big one that, is, that even young assistant coaches and pro assistant coaches have no idea about. You look around next time you get on the bus, when your bus is leaving, whether you're a pro coach or a high school coach or whatever, young kids coach, young kids probably not so much, but as you're working in, head coaches, shit, they're freaked out when you're coming up on a deadline. And assistant coaches are just laid back, they're chilled out, figuring out what movie they're gonna watch on the ride up. Head coaches are nervous, they're looking out the window. Why is that? This, is, this goes along with the culture of your team and the way that you run your things. A, a head coach has to react to everything. If a guy's one minute late, that ruins the head coach's day because now he has to act. He has to act, and that makes things rough. If you can help fix those things before, you're helping yourself. Your head coach now on the bus ride is in a bad mood. He's pissed off, and now he's thinking – I have to suspend this guy for a half. I have to take him out because he was five minutes late. And because if I don't, then it's going to run rampant throughout my team. So don't just throw those onto the head coach. Get yourself, try to get everybody there. Be a part of the process that makes things run. Okay, get, help things run smoothly. If you can do that, you're helping your coach out and he may not even know it, but you're making your life better. Shit, I'm telling you what, if you're sitting on the bus and three guys are late and you're an assistant, if you have a good head coach, you're going to have a shitty day because now he's pissed. Now when you get to the, where you're going, he's like, we're having a meeting. Our team's not committed. Our guys are being late. What's going on? If you need to fix it at the front, not at the back. At the front, not at the back. Okay, communication is everything. Now in pro basketball, communication is where it gets more and more difficult. High school coaches are some of the best coaches I've ever seen. 
um, for the game. Um, college coaches are some of the best business style leaders and pro coaches are some of the best communicators. Um, the reason for that is because the players now, be, they gain an identity, they gain an independence in, in, as, as a professional. And now your communication level has to be versatile. Where in, in high school or in college, the players are gonna fall in line much, much faster. In the pros, you have to be able to communicate at a different level. You can tell where you're at many times. Um, younger coaches typically joke around a lot with players, which is fine, but many of them rely on that when they have to communicate difficult situations with players. Um, if, you aren't, if you can't build a, a relationship with a player by the time the season comes, to be able to be direct with him and not validate his negativity, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, then you know you're getting somewhere. If you have to joke about somebody's shooting percentage or free throw percentage or that they shot bad, if you have to joke with them before you get into a conversation, you know you're still at a low level of communication. How do you do that? You do it by working with, and as I say, we have a bigger staff. Sometimes there'll be play, coaches work with just a certain amount of players that they can get to, and they're not going to go to the most difficult ones. Um, you work by building that direct, that direct communication and go nowhere else. And I'll go to the validation point. In communicating with the player, are you enabling him? So if I kick the bench, a lot of times, if a player kicks the bench and walks to the end of the bench, a lot of times your head coach will send you down there. Go make sure he's okay. Go take care of him. This is a vital time in your career as a, an assistant coach. You better have built something up by that point. You better have built an ability to communicate before he sends you down there in the most stressful time you could do uh, talk to a player when he's not getting what he wants in a game. If you have to go down there and you sit down there and he's like, why is he taking me out? I'm killing these guys. And you for one second validate him by saying, putting your hand on his knee saying, you know, you're right, but you'll get another chance. When you said you're right for that one-tenth of a second, you validated that he, that player is, is right over his head coach from your mouth. And what you did was put yourself at a lower level. He lost respect for you right there. At that moment, that player knows he's wrong. And you need to be able to look at him and say, whatever it would be, but never validate. You need to be able to look at him and say, look, you know how to act, be a man. I'm not going to tell you what to say, but you have to evolve your direct communication and be able to look somebody in the eye, tell them the situation, and have them deal with their, with their adversity at the moment. And if you hadn't built that up before that time, you don't want to be in that situation, okay? Uh, you can't enable players and talk to their, uh, about their negativity when they're in a bad mood. You have to start in practice. You have to start in, uh, outside of practice. You have to get them ready for it. You have to have them know that if, when you come down there, you're going to support them. You want them to know you're there for them, but you're not going to validate it, and it should be – the way they're acting should be the only thing that you're speaking of, not whether they're right or wrong. They should know. Um, the last thing we talk about, this is a different topic, but can players that spend tons of time in player development also be effective coaching players as game coaches? I've talked to people overseas, uh, even ACB guys, assistants, that are now taking their player development coaches and moving them out of their tactical, like game bench coaches, because the time they're spending with their players is so much that they're having trouble with the communication. They're almost too close to those players. Hopefully, if you have, a, if you have something to talk to me about with that, hopefully put that in your questions for after, because that's another thing. I'll, I'll repeat it again. Can player development coaches be as effective as tactical coaches? People believe both ways. So we'll talk about that. Everybody wants to be a head coach uh, at some point. Um, if you looked at my, my um, resume, I guess, earlier, I mean, I've been a head coach a good maybe seven, eight times, it's, and I love being a head coach. Um, 
I do like being an assistant because I don't like dealing with the bullshit. I don't like always having to, you know, talk to media. I'm not a speaker. I don't like to speak. I like doing this because, uh, you know, this is helping people that are, you know, do something that I really like and I've done for a long time, but I'm not the type of guy that likes to go give speeches at the boys club. If you like that, that's great. But most people now, and in the last couple of years, everybody I talked to in and around the G league want to be NBA head coaches or NBA GMs, and they're setting their goals high. That's great. Set your goals high, but you have to understand that just being a great coach isn't going to get you to be a head coach. You have to be able to get those jobs and you have to be direct. If you're a person that's struggling with communication, then you don't want to be a head coach right now. You know, my years of wanting to be a great assistant has made me an assistant. I think people view me as that. I don't mind if my career is, is, is defined as being an assistant coach. I really don't. Now, if I felt that things were evolving right and I could get a head coaching job that I could do well, I would definitely do it. Do I think I can do it? Of course. Um, but I don't bleed to be a head coach. I'd love to coach. I love the locker room and I love everybody around the team and the seasons, but I don't see myself bleeding to go into business meetings every day. And I don't see myself uh, wanting to do media every day. So, I mean, I, you know, as I said, where are you at? What are some pros of being a, 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 an assistant? Again, those type of things, your relationship with the players can be much closer you don't have to worry so much about off court. You can worry about um, on court. You can do your tactical. You get to be involved in the scouting. Those are things that are great. A lot of time, assistant coaches don't do those type of things as much. And it's, it's something that I still love to do. So to me, that's a pro. Um, again, the cons are if you've evolved past it and you think that every time you look at a decision being made, that it bothers you. It happens. Believe me. And if that's the case, you either need to be good enough to be a head coach or you need to or you're not being a good assistant coach. You have to understand that if you're disagreeing with everything that you see on a daily basis coming out of your coaches meetings and your staff meetings, you may be in the wrong place because as I said earlier, there's a million ways to do it. Do you believe in zone defense? Good. Well, man defense still works. Do you believe in playing fast on offense? Good. Playing slow still works. Everything works. And if it's just, if you're this just one way type person, you may have to go be a head coach if you can do it or get yourself in the right mindset to be an assistant. Because if you're in, if you're just doing the job to be an assistant, because one day you're going to be a head coach, you're probably not doing a good job. Sorry about that. In game, in game, when the ball goes up, whether I don't care if you're a pro coach or a little kid's coach or whatever you're doing. When the ball goes up, are you, are you too fired up to see the game? Are you just going wild? I mean, that happens to me even now, even in my old age. But this is for everybody. If you're, it doesn't matter who's on the call or whatever. This is for everybody. When the ball goes up, you need to look at the details early. What are they playing? How are they playing their pick and roll coverage? Who's their best offensive player? What's their continuity offense? Those things you need to be, you need to have those in the first two or three trips down the court. Now that takes some time. Sometimes it'll take you longer. That's fine. It doesn't matter. But you need to know those things immediately. And the first time out, you need to have some adjustments in your mind. So you're not watching the game from the sideline as a, as a uh, fan with the good seat. Um, but you need to know what's going on in the game. You know, for me in the pros, I have learned a long time ago to not coach so much. So I'll do these things and learn these things and I'll wait to see what my head coach asked me because I know my head coach sees the same things. If he's not seeing something or not understanding how he sees it, he's going to ask me. But where you're coaching younger kids with less experienced coaches, you guys should be talking about that. They're playing zone, they're playing box and one. How are we going to deal with that? Um, what's their offensive plays? What's their defense doing? Um, and then note those things, okay? 
be calm and time your suggestions. I mean, don't just sit there and just constantly talk because your voice just goes to nothing. Um, you'll see it and hear it with the assistants all the time. And, you know, again, head coaches have a ton to think about. Don't just throw bullshit at them. Like, number 20 is killing us. Like, believe me, he knows number 20 is killing us. Don't throw out things that are low-hanging fruit. Everybody sees those things. Think of something specific that you can easily get a point across and be ready with that when it comes to you, okay? The one thing that, you know, people that know me that are on here are probably going to laugh, but when you guys are probably laughing at this, but when I'm a head coach, I don't let my assistants talk to the refs. I know you guys are probably thinking, what a hypocritical son of a bitch. But <laughs> Kobe's nicer than, than me uh, with that. But also – you guys are probably going to laugh at this, but, uh, you know, two of the last three years, I haven't got a technical. So let's make sure that we know the stats. But um, you have to let the head coaches work their, re their officials in their own way. When he has three assistants fuck screaming at him, they can't do what they want to do with the ref. Sometimes a, a head coach likes to get a bad call against them. Sometimes it's good when there's five to oh fouls against you. He doesn't need the three assistants going, it's 5-0, it's 5-0 foul count, what's going on? The head coach will work it better than you will by just screaming out at the official. Let him work it in the best way where he they walks over and he talks to him looking in his eye, and then he'll get a call later down the road. But don't blow those, those beneficial situations by screaming at a rep and then the rep gets in his head, well, screw those guys, they're screaming at me. Let them work the officials as they want to. In practice, prepare the details that you're running, and you better have them down to the point of your details or your, your practices are detailed out. There's nothing worse than a confused coach with players walking around. Um, get your players in one place where you can speak to them. You know, for me, if you know me, I'm, I'm a sh really short guy. I have to put all the people in one spot so they can, I can talk to them. A lot of times, like, Coaches that are tall can bring everybody in and everybody sees them. I get people in one spot so I can talk to them. They can, I can make sure that they're where they're, you know, where they're at. I can look them in the eye. Also, don't wing anything. If you're winging it, everybody can tell. They can tell you spent no time on it. Prepare, okay? Um, productive energy. Like a lot of times I'll give a lot of uh, – I give people shit – when they're just clapping and like just noise for noise, um, it's something that I talk shit to coaches about all the time, kind of in a joking way. But um, when you get up to, it's funny, like some high level pros will tell you, when well, we don't need you pumping us up. We can get it going. Uh, but in, in high school and college and even in the pros, energy from the assistants in a, in a, in a better way, more than just clapping or yelling, is more beneficial than random noise, okay? Now, the practice that you're working, whether your head coach is running it or you're running it, if you're in that practice, you should be able to run that whole practice. You should be able to see the practice schedule. You should be able to know every drill before it starts, and you should be able to ask somebody if you don't and be ready to do it. Um, when I and I'll go down here as quick as I can, always have a player development workout ready before you get to the gym that day uh, for all three positions, uh, you know, either for guards, bigs, wings, in case your coach tells you, okay, we're doing this PD workout. Don't be sitting there and just have guys with the ball or doing simple things. Have it in your mind. Be prepared for player development stuff in case it comes up when you weren't prepared. And have it ready to where every day you can do something a little bit different. All right. Maybe your coach puts that in the whole practice, then you don't have to worry about it. But if you get to the gym, have a player development workout ready. Um, I'm going to skip that one. Okay. Read your players and react. We can skip that. Um, so you have to be a problem. You're a problem solver as an assistant. You're getting balls off the court, put them on the rack. You're getting balls ready for the next drill. You're not above that. That's what your job is. Managers, you don't fire balls at the manager to put them on the rack. You go do it. Assistant coaches do those things. They're not the head coach. You're not above that. Um, again, down here at the bottom, the community events, business appearances. Um, I, like, I volunteer 
I feel like it's part of my job to volunteer every single time. Um, we have our situation now with our coaches. We can rotate. Um, the last coach I worked for, it didn't matter if it was the smallest or biggest event. Every single player and every single coach went to every single community event. That solved a lot of problems. The way we do it now doesn't pose any problems. We cover everything. But that's two different ways of doing it. For me, Brian Walsh, I believe if, if a community event comes up that I'm supposed to volunteer immediately, that's just me. It doesn't make me better than somebody else. But I do feel like it, it makes me closer to the business side of the people, uh, of the organization, and I, learn, I meet a lot more people. And it, I usually end up enjoying those things immensely, and they're not typically very hard. So you come out of it, and it's a lot more benefit than just kind of going on to the next guy. So be ready to do those events. Scouts, of course, this is short. This, there's, we, you're going to be, have my email. You guys can ask me detailed questions of scouts and offenses and defenses all you want. I'll respond to you. But doing scouts, just a few things. First, of course, your head coach is going to give you the format. That's obvious. But regardless, um, your part of it needs to be as simple as possible. You don't want to go too deep regardless of the level. Even in the pros, we try to be as simple as we can. You take away what you can with the least amount of talk. If players start talking, asking many, many questions about your scouting report, they're probably not understanding it. Okay? Now, for those of you that use scout teams, prep teams, put them on, walk through, or run through drills. You don't walk on the court without prepping that team well in advance of practice. They have to be ready to go before practice starts. If you come out and say, hey, Joey, come out here. You're the point guard. Uh, Louie, you're in the corner. That doesn't work well at all. You look disorganized, unprepared. Have that all done way before your walkthrough. Have the people that are going to run those spots know the drills and know them beforehand. It's better to have them run through the whole offense beforehand if you can Okay, again, the scouts, prep your offense for what your opponents are going to do defensively. So if I'm going to run a certain kind of different kind of pick and rolls, different kind of things in my game, I'm going to show my team the way it's going to be guarded so they see it in the most relevant way that's about to happen in a couple hours. Okay, and then again, too much talk in pregame just gets guys wandering. You're going to lose a lot in the, in the crossover. You want to keep it short. Keep it as short as you can. And then you want to develop a pregame, not only that, a shoot-around and pregame rhythm where on game days your players are in and out quick, they know what's coming, and they can focus. Okay? Now, it's important to understand this. And even in my late years, you know, this year it was good. I thought our staff kind of came together. It's, it, a lot of people have insecurities about what they know and don't know, and there will be – They'll be sitting in meetings or getting going to practice with some butterflies in their stomach because maybe they're not great X's and O's people and they understand defense. Maybe they're not, you know, they don't understand these complex drills that we're about to do. Those are, that's, that's normal. When, you, if, when you're going into, some of these drills these coaches have are amazing, especially when I go see high school coaches. I don't know what's going on. I have to learn the drill, even though I've been doing it for a long time. The way you see the game is valuable. And just stay calm, and you'll learn it. X's and O's are simple. It's, it's very simple. It means nothing. Like, as I, when I'm an assistant for many years, I, I lose my ability to draw set plays really well. And then when I become a head coach again, and I get it back in no time, it goes up and down. But – some coaches are great with workouts and they can say, okay, get three man workout and do this over here and put it into your offense. Okay. And what people want to do is you want to get shots in your player development that you get out of your offense, right? That's difficult for somebody. Just ask, just ask, don't be afraid. It doesn't make you look like a bad coach to say, Hey man, you sound like you really, that you sound like, you know, what's going on. Show me how to do that. Exactly. That doesn't say – no. that coach isn't going to go say, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. Make sure you ask. It means nothing. The coach will be happy to show you, even if you're new to that staff, even if you're helping somewhere else. Ask people how to do it. you rather do it right 
then you'll you'll be a better coach as you can as you can. Now also ask on all the details of defense. If you don't know where to put your hand coming out of uh, an, an ice coverage, just ask. It doesn't look bad if you don't know. Um, the way you see the game is going to evolve the longer you're doing it. And these little details mean nothing because you can learn them. They're not hard. I remember a guy that we he he was obsessed with writing basketball X's and O's on napkins because it was a thing back in the day where guys would go have a beer and put them on napkins. And he would say, you're so good at X's and O's, B. I can't believe how good you are. And I was thinking, I'm really shitty at X's and O's. But um, And then 10 years later, this guy's a head coach in the CBA and he made it to the NBA. He couldn't even draw as simple as play. And then he's drawing out shit for in the championship in the G League. It takes nothing and it's easy. So don't think it's too hard. Whatever you're doing, you can get it. Okay, remember, staff isn't a competition. You need to find ways to get along with the other assistants no matter what. You owe that to the head coach. He shouldn't have to be worried about that. And it happens a lot. It happens a ton. You need to be able to get find some sort of, some sort of bridge between you and everybody else, okay? The biggest thing I'm going to leave on this is you need to be able to leave the room and be behind whatever you guys decide on, even if you were deeply, deeply against what has been decided. You need to be able to come out of that room and teach it on the court like it was your idea. If you can't do that, you're not ready to be a head coach or an assistant coach yet, okay? You need to be able to come in that room, give your opinion, get told no, and go on the court and coach just like you were just like it's your idea. Make sure you remember that because that's a big deal. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. And you'll see guys, when they're told no in the room, they can't leave the room and be the same coach that they are. Okay? Um, here's the stuff that you can get a hold. You can always get a hold of me. This email, I don't look at that much. But now that Nick put it on here, I'll probably look at it. Um, my Twitter account, I have like five followers. But... Uh, I do look at that, so you can hit me up on that. But as we get into the question and answer part, I'm excited. I hope I didn't take too long, but um, let's just get going with it. Really, these 45 minutes went by super fast. And I, I, didn't, I didn't even think that it's, it's already that. So while people are uh, typing in their questions, and also if you want to unmute yourself, we can do that too. So whatever you feel comfortable with. Uh, Brian, I wanted to ask a couple of the questions. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned that uh, we can also talk how player development coaches on the team staff, uh, how they can be as effective as the assistant coaches. Uh, in your opinion, what do they have to do in order to be as efficient as the assistant coaches? Wait, now, which coach? I'm sorry, the first part, I, I, I didn't know. Oh, okay, no, so... That's a great question. So, no, so th what I want to do is be clear. I was having a conversation with somebody from, uh, from Spain about they're starting to move their player development coaches um, and some of the teams, not all of them, uh, off of the benches to make them mainly coaches. Not only do they coach the pros, but they're player development all down the line to the young kids. And because they spend so much time with those players, um, and this isn't just there, this is – this is a philosophy that's mm -hmm. either becoming uh, relevant uh, in a few places. But what it comes down to is when players spend that much time, when you open up the gym at midnight and you're two and three hours with these guys extra every day, are you able to coach that guy in a direct way? Have you become too close? To answer your question, keep it real the whole time. Make sure that guy knows that if, if he's – if he – if he messes up, you're going to be right there. You're going to be right on his ass, and that's it. But the thing is, typically that's hard for people. You want to make sure that he knows that regardless if you're going to get up at midnight or 9 o'clock at night, go open the gym with him, you're his buddy. There, I mean, there's no way around it. You're doing that for him. But he has to know, if you kick the chair, I'm not with you. You know, if you can't handle it, I'm not with you. You have to be direct. Mm-hmm. Great. And I see that through the people who are in the chat, uh, the Russian ones, most of them are doing player development now. 
but I still know that some of them are willing to be assistant coaches in the future. So in your opinion, what player development coaches need to do in order to be more prepared to be the assistant coach when, when their opportunity comes? Well, one thing I know, one thing I know is if they want to combine or connect their player development with the offenses that the coaches are running, I think that'll help them a ton. So if they're going to, if they're going to work out with a player, if they can find out what that player's offense is and what they're running and pattern their, the shots and things that they're getting in their player development, that they're going to that the same shots as players getting in a game, the coaches are going to see that as hugely valuable. Um, okay. And I think that that would be the number one thing for a player development coach that if you can, if you, it, I think that head coach would actually appreciate that to no end. If he knew that when he goes to work with this coach, these players are getting work that he wants them to get, meaning the same shots that he's getting in games. Mm -hmm. And probably the same you would want if a player is working with somebody individually. So if I'm a player development coach who is not working for the team, right. And you would want the same actions. Right. Well, you're going to do best for the player. If you're, if you're, if his player development is connecting with his offense. So whether you can talk to the coach or not, the player is going to know, get the work from the player. Like what, what, what shots do you get in a game? Make those the main shots that they're working on in practice. What, where, where do you see yourself handling the ball in the game? Let's handle the ball in practice at the same place. That's, that will be valuable for the co that player. And then if he ever tries to go see that coach and try to work for him, Believe me, he's going to value that, that, hey, when I, when I was working with your guys, I was putting them through the stuff that, that I saw you guys getting shots in the games. Mm -hmm. Guarantee you the coach would love that. Guarantee. Yeah, I experienced that. Fully agree with you. Uh, all right, we have a question from Indonesia. Uh, coach, how are you starting to work with a new head coach? Do you make some rules between you and the head coach? Right, well, no, see – the, uh, the head coach makes all the rules uh, and that's typically the way it should be. Um, and even, you know, now that I'm an older guy, typically I'm older than most of the coaches I work with. I still don't feel like I'm their boss just because I'm older. They work for, I work for them and I'm happy to, because that's what my, that's what I like to do. But, you know, whether you have a disciplinarian hardcore head coach or a guy that's nicer, you just want their, their life to be easier. I mean, that's a good philosophy, a way to look at it. A lot of times, man, if you, if, you're, if, you, if, you, if you get a head coach that's in a bad mood, your day's hard. But no, he makes the rules, you follow the rules. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Nick actually stole my question, but that's fine, Nick. Uh, what, would you know, what would you now tell yourself starting your career? What's one thing you would go back and let yourself know? I would, um, I kind of talking about this. I spent a lot of time trying to hide things that I wasn't good at rather than just getting good at them. You know, um, like I said, I, it took me a long time to realize the basketball um, X's and O's and working out and things, they're easy. Um, just, you know, I would, go around and try to learn things without asking questions. Um, in my old age, now I respect the young guys who ask me. When I was a young kid, I, was, I wasn't a good communicator anyway. I wasn't a really good, I wasn't a good person in my young days. So, I mean, I did everything on my own. So I was gonna go around, I wasn't gonna ask you. I was gonna, I was a competitive dude. I wanted to be better than you, or be better. So I wasn't gonna ask you how to run that drill like, man, that was a hell of a drill. I would learn it on my own. It's a lot better to just ask people. Mm -hmm. And I, I and, you know, do that from, when you're young, ask everything you can. Stay around everybody you can. Um, be, be, you know what else? Be super organized in the things that you learn. Like so many things I picked up, like this is some, this is kind of how I do things, you know, right now. <laughs> like this is how I prepared for this like 7,000 things. That's how I used to get ready for like seasons. I would write them like that. And I, for, I lost a ton in the, um, 
and the changeovers and moving from country to country. Now I have an amazing system and like I can go back and find what we ran different play, but be really organized and make sure at the end of every season, you have a playbook. And nowadays it's so easy to have video playbooks to always go back. Like not everybody has like Beaumont, Anthony Beaumont, like we do that just like puts everything on a platter for you. But if you can, when the season's over, you don't want to forget what you ran in these certain situations so make sure you have everything from your seasons. You, you wouldn't believe how much you go back and use them. Got it. Got it. And next one, uh, assistant head coach meets a lot of difficulties in the work. How did you cope with them? What helped you overcome stress? Well, it took me a long time to like learn how to get like in, in shape and get healthy. Um, you know, I did, I used to, I didn't have a great lifestyle up until 19, 2007. I did a lot of stuff. I, I dealt with the stress in like ways that people used to. I was a drinker, did all that stuff. Now, as I evolved and like now I'm 13 years into like a clean lifestyle, it took me a long time. But as I said, I'm the type of person that learns the hard way. Um, I make the same mistake 38 times until I fix it. Um, but the stress that, you know, the great thing is, and I don't know, you know, there's levels that people are working at. If your job is just basketball, honestly, you don't have any real stress. Um, so look at it like that. I mean, if your job's just basketball, you're really lucky. Um, and that's where I've been able to kind of grasp onto. I have like the best job in the world, if you can imagine. I can get up and I can work out and I can go to a coach's meeting. And then I can go to practice and then I can work out with players and I can go home. Like it's the easiest type of job to coach. It's hard to coach kids in high school and do that stuff. That's much, much harder. Um, so if you're working just in basketball, you know, work on your stress. You have a pretty easy job of it. If you're working in high school, it's tougher, but enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Got it. And next one we have from coach uh, Tim O'Toole. He's asking, did technology help you organize your system? And if so, what software? Well, yeah, tech not like, so it's funny, the, these systems that we work with now, Synergy and Sports Code, um, they're so easy. They're so user friendly. Um, um, but yeah, so I have our, our player, our playbook from the last, um, what was it? Four years, three years, because there was someone in Beaumont's been working. And I even think the year previous when Nick had to fill in as a uh, coach that we have a, a video playbook from there. But yeah, the, the technology now, if you can learn these, and I don't even know how expensive it is. It might be, it might not be feasible, but Synergy and, and, and these, these technologies really help you. Um, but if not, you still need to know and have your playbook, whether it's on paper, whether it's on uh, fast draw, you need to have your playbook from each season to be able to go back. Okay. Okay. So pretty much synergy, synergy is a good help. Synergy is like all there. Like, you know, that's the, that's the whole data. That's the data of the world. That's where we live, you know? Um, and for those of us that not only coach, but our talent scouts and look for players and do that, you know, there's no other way. There's really no other way. If you're a type of guys, you guys talked about alternative, alternative um, video on Nick's um, <laughs> podcast the other day or whatever it is, Nick's uh, clinic the other day. I don't know what you guys came up with outside of Synergy. Mm -hmm. If you came up with anything. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. <laughs> And so uh, I, want, I wanted to ask while we're waiting for other questions as well, uh, what was the main difference for you being assistant coach in G League in the United States and internationally? I understand the culture difference is still, it's different if we talk about Middle East, China, and Eastern Europe, but is there something, um, is there something that was similar in those countries? Right, yeah, so you know is from coaching overseas and in china so typically if you head overseas as a head coach the team's probably not doing well right 
So right when you mm -hmm. get in there, your team is probably flawed in some degree already. So when you get in there, you're behind the eight ball. Overseas, especially in China, they want you to be good like the next day. Like you get there, they want you to be good. If you don't have a good couple weeks, you're already gone. So being a head coach overseas is not only hard, you have to get – you have to be pretty lucky and things have to bounce right to stay there. Going overseas as, as an assistant is a lot of fun um, because you, get, you can meet these coaches. Typically your main responsibility is the American players, but I always branched out and never really just did that. I always – you know, was coaching everybody, but it's just going overseas. You have to enjoy the, the, the journey. I mean, I really uh, love, that's why like I went, I've gone to places that most people don't go to. That's why uh, I was doing that on purpose to go to like some of the most exotic places for the, you know, the, the experience of going there. But then like, so if you can imagine going to Saudi Arabia and um, just being with those people. Um, that's great. If you can go there as a head coach, it's much more stressful because they're, le they're less knowledgeable and they want you to win because you have an American coach immediately. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's no real chance to build your team. And you pre it's hard to turn them around before they're ready to get another American coach in there. But going as an assistant is the best way to start. Mm -hmm. Got it. And uh, what was what was the biggest challenge that you had as assistant coach? Doesn't matter in the United States or overseas. As an assistant, I know the there are probably many. Right, but I mean the, the biggest the you know I always I've been lucky to be a be able to coach with a lot of people. The challenges that you face are being away from my family. Um, okay. you know, it's really, you know, whether it's irresponsible or not, you know, they say being an assistant coach, especially one that goes overseas is a single man's job. I don't want to pigeonhole anybody, but when you're, when you're versatile and able to move and go overseas, uh, at the drop of a hat, that's really good. A lot of times I've bolted overseas. Um, I left a job in Vietnam that I really wanted to go there. And I landed and I was so pained inside that I just left the next day because my son was sad when I was leaving and it was last minute. And um, I was, I felt horrible on the flight. And even though I got there and I was like, I was in Ho Chi Minh city and I loved it and it was beautiful. And uh, the blustering city with, and uh, I couldn't stay. I was too heartbroken and I had to immediately leave. It was really hard to tell that coach that I was, that I was going over there to help. But um, it just, th that was the thing, like it rips my heart out. Now today I live in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I work in LA and it's an hour flight. And my family's now kind of used to it. My wife's almost better off with me gone now. But when, when they can get out there in an hour and it's not a big deal, but yeah, it's leaving the family. My, that's been my, that was my biggest challenge every okay. time. Okay, got it. And uh, you obviously talked about what uh, assistant coaches need to do in order to be successful. But if we just uh, explain shortly in one minute, what would be an example of an ideal assistant coach? How would he behave? Uh, and what would he do daily? Let's say from the moment he enters the practice facility in the morning. Right. <clears throat> well, to me, a guy that gets there for a one o'clock practice at 8 a.m. that talks to the GM and the people all down the hallway and the ticket people and uh, makes his rounds around the facility and then um, gets to his office and, you know, gets a workout, shows it, gets himself feeling good, be ready to go, then connects with his staff and very early, many, many hours before getting himself prepared for the day um, and just connecting with everyone around him, going into the people that have the most stressful time before practice, which is the training staff, asking them if they need any help, 
preparing themselves uh, with whatever scouts coming up because typically you have work down the road. So in that time in the morning to get some work done, to get ahead and just be ready for the day. But it's just the person that doesn't live his life for himself for that moment. He's basically there for the machinery of the team to run and to make mm -hmm. his head coach's life easy. Mm -hmm. And do you think that also if an assistant coach is willing to sweat with the players, it would help him to build relationships and build the trust, kind of like sweat equity? Oh, it's great. Yeah, players love that. I mean, you know, nowadays if you can play basketball you're, or you can guard players, bigger guys, or, you know, they like that to hire guys that can do that. Um, some, you know, it, it's something that's – growing not all coaches want to do it but a lot of coaches are doing it to bring people in that can that can play but also guys that get in the gym do the workouts with them that's a good time to where you're working out he's working out it's not you servicing them it's basically two people talking um, that's a good time to get actual real communication mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. makes sense and uh, obviously you have a vast experience uh, during your time, during your coaching experience, were there any books that influenced the way uh, I want to say the way you think doesn't necessarily mean thinking about basketball, but maybe just looking at the situations in life in general. Well, I don't, this might disappoint people. Like I don't read basketball books. Um, uh -huh. Not that I don't think they're not that I don't think they're valuable. Like I like, if I'm going to read a book, I'm going to read, William Burroughs or Faulkner. That's what I told Nick. But I mean, that's what I that's what I do. It just I don't like to sit down and read a book, but it does uh, on basketball. But I do like to talk about super deep things that relate to basketball. So if you want to read a book that relates to basketball, read Naked Lunch. But you won't know <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> Not at all. By the way, that's not a sex book or anything. <laughs> it just says naked lunch. There's nobody naked in it. Okay. Uh, since there are no more questions, I have one more. And I want to say it's kind of like off the topic. What do you like teaching the most on the court? I like getting a team's best thing they do and completely shutting it down simple okay <laughs> I, you okay. know that, i mean because you know teams teams win they beat you on their staple on their staple so if a team has a play that they go to multiple times a game uh i like to prepare if i'm going to do a scouting port and a team goes to something um too many times during a game i like to be able to figure something out with the staff to completely shut down that and our staff's been pretty good at that in past years when we have to win games, like in the playoffs. I think we've done a good job uh, of where teams have specific things they go to. And um, we're, good, we're pretty good at shutting it down. That's my favorite thing. Okay. I'm, I'm taking notes on that for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to shut mind, people I, down what they like to do. <laughs> and if you don't mind, I have one more question that just came up to my mind. Uh, again, based on your experience, what would be, uh, what would the ideal film breakdown for a team would look for you? Just knowing that players' attention span is not that long, and just to make sure that the players are focused through the whole video session, how how would you make it to make sure they're concentrated the whole time? If your team's flowing, you're winning games, and things are going good. I like to go very short. I do like to put negative and positive. I don't know if it's uh, – I don't care about the, the, um, the um, you know, numbers. I like to do both. Um, I don't think it – I think if your players are that sensitive that you have to work on that, uh, they have to be able to handle that. However, if your team's doing badly, if you're not winning games, you're playing poorly, I think you can go more negative. But if your team's going well, I think you want to go short and you want to get in and out quickly. Um, no more than 10 minutes, and then, you know, you're rolling in and out. And that's a, a post-game scouting report. Uh, some guys do practice. Uh, we'll do post-game. Um, but if 
Uh, did I say scouting report or post game? But yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't mean scouting report. I mean post game film breakdown is what I mean. Mm-hmm. Short stuff. Uh, if your team needs a needs kind of a, a wake up call, I'm not opposed to like every now and then just watching the whole game as a grind, showing every detail of how you guys got there. I know people don't like to do that. Uh, every now and then we'll do that. We'll watch a quarter or a half uh, when we need to see maybe how our energy was low and when it changed. Um, sometimes play after play after play, you don't get to see that. So I think you do your typical quick scouting reports, but every now and then, um, every now and then throw in something different, like a full game. Okay. Okay. And you mentioned that you don't care about the numbers in between positives and negatives. Would I that, don't. Would neg- I, I uh-huh. typically don't, like for me, if I'm making the decisions. Again, okay. now, Kobe Carl likes much more positive than negative. Um, but again, Kobe would still make the switch if we are just not flowing. He'll go with some negative. Um, he's very culture-oriented. He wants people to... You know, he likes to connect. He cares about their feelings. So he, he do, definitely is conscious of what we're showing them. Um, but so he likes to go like pretty much, I'd probably say seven positive, three negative, if I were to okay. guess with, with him. I said, for me, I don't know if it really matters because typically with the players, I've always have that relationship built where from day one, where it's not personal, brother. We're just going to do it. So you got to mm-hmm. see it and you can handle it, especially if you're coaching pros, they need to be able to see what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense. Well, I'm out of questions. It was, it was terrific. I loved it. And I'm sure that people who listen to it, so uh, they did too. But well, there's any- can get, like I said, it's, it's hard to, you could talk all day on this. I'm sure there's some specific questions. Anybody, please email me um, or Twitter me. Uh, hit me up in the, if you have any questions about anything. I'd be happy to uh, to respond. Mm-hmm. Thank you again for your time, Brian. Thanks, guys. Thanks to everybody for coming. Yep. And again, for the ones who missed it, uh, or if you want to rewatch it, we'll save the stream. We'll upload it to YouTube just so you can watch it later too. And I'm sure either me or Nick will email it to you as well, just so you can use it. All right, man. I appreciate it, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, Coach Pitt. I like the pit. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. All right. Who's from Pitt, boss? Uh, Coach Tim O'Toole. Wow. Yeah, we had so far one, two, three, four, about five or six coaches from Russia. So yeah. they, they were working with uh, Tesca youth team, like youth clubs uh, with the kids or – just doing player development by themselves, trying to trying to get to the next level. Or I also see a coach from Indonesia. Obviously, Rob is here. And then uh, Nikola, he was uh, DOBO of uh, Windy City a couple of years ago. Uh, young coach from Serbia. So uh, Tim O'Toole, uh, obviously Nick. So we have a pretty international group out here. Yeah, I love it. All your friends from Russia. I'm ready to go back over to Russia. So yep. anyone just hit me up. I'll be there. I'm cheap. Yep. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll make it soon. If not coronavirus, we would already make it, but we'll yeah. still do that. All right, man. Thanks, guys. That was fun. That was fun. Yep. Fully agree. All, All right. right. See you, man. Later, guys. Yeah.